Welcome to the sixth Pink's Lecture for BCRCWA for 2020. Uh, glad you can make it. For those of you who um, have been before, you know what the format is, but for those who haven't been, just a few pointers. This meeting is for you and, uh, you know, to help you guys. So please feel free to um, interrupt and uh, ask questions. But as well as that, I've actually uh, broken up the talk so that after each section, each topic, it gives you a bit of a chance to ask questions and make comments so that uh, you get the most out of this meeting as possible. So both by, uh, I think, topics that I find people uh, bring up when I, I see them and also by special requests. These are the kind of topics I'm going to try and cover uh, in the next hour or so. And I think I really want to make a point because this, this um, education session is uh, a focus for women uh, and their families who are experiencing um, a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer. And I just want to make the point that metastatic breast cancer and early breast cancer are essentially two different conditions. And I think sometimes in conversation in, uh, with friends and family, you might meet someone who also says she has breast cancer. You start switching stories and comparing things. And just be very careful that you aren't talking to someone with early breast cancer and therefore her views are very, very different. Her concepts, her questions are going to be very, very different. Uh, I've been asked to talk again about CDK inhibitors and I think that's a really good question and a good topic to discuss because there's been some new data in the last 12 months as well as immunotherapy which is really the hot topic that everybody thinks is the, the, for the future of uh, breast cancer and other cancers. For the first time I'm actually going to talk a little bit about lifestyle factors because although this is not an area which often gets a lot of uh, scientific research there is certainly growing evidence about things that you can do in your uh, lifestyle choices that will impact on how you do with your uh, treatment uh, and also in some respects with prognosis. By popular demand, I've been asked to talk about tumour markers again. So I'm going to put a limit on it. I'm only going to discuss tumour markers every second year. And I'm expecting for those of you who have heard the tumour marker story once or twice, I expect you to educate your friends, all right? Um, and then probably the most important thing, which is often forefront in, in, in most uh, patients and families' mind, is what can be done to improve survival. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a spiel on that. Just a little bit of basic science, and a lot of people said they found this sort of interesting but also very helpful, is just to give you a concept of what the disease is that we're dealing with. So this slide is a picture uh, at a microscopic level of normal breast tissue. So the points I would uh, bring out is that each of the breast cells are, are pretty uniform in, sh in size. The two arrows show the dark bits in the middle of the, of the uh, breast cell, which is the nucleus. We all have nuclei in the middle of our, our cells. You need the nucleus because it's the powerhouse of the cell. It's what's responsible for helping that cell to grow and live and do the job that it's supposed to do. On the right is a picture of an invasive breast cancer. And the differences, which I hope you will see, is number one, the size of the cells are actually quite bizarre. Many of them are bigger compared to normal breast cells, but they're unusual shape. And probably the most important thing I would bring to your attention is see the black areas? That's the size of the nucleus in a breast cancer cell. So look at that in the myriad of breast cancer cells compared to these little tiny um, nuclei in normal cells. So that sort of gives you a concept that the nucleus of a breast cancer cell is what drives the cancer to multiply, to grow, to invade, to spread, to resist treatment. So you're really dealing with two very, very different uh, biological entities uh, when you're dealing with cancer cells. Now a bit of basic anatomy. Um, this is a cartoon of a woman's breast, um, and the lines are actually the networks of lymphatic tissues that drain um, fluids and allow cellular movement from within the breast to go into the lymph glands. And these are the lymph glands under the armpit. These are the lymph glands behind your breastplate. And they both sort of join up and end up in lymph glands in your neck. And from that time point, it can then travel into the bloodstream and go beyond. This is a picture of a cancer. So this tissue here is reasonably normal, but all this yellowy sort of stuff, and particularly this white stuff in the middle, all this is what a cancer looks like. 
So when you have um, scans of uh, your body and look at uh, bone scans and MRI, what the pictures are showing on those scans are these sorts of tissue abnormalities within the organs that we're looking at, okay? So what happens uh, that allows a cancer cell to go beyond um, the breast and the lymph glands and end up in giving uh, women stage four breast cancer? So essentially when a breast cancer starts, if you uh, find the cancer very early and it's only confined to the breast, that's a stage one breast cancer. If the cancer has grown very quickly or it's taken a little bit longer to find the cancer, the cancer can get bigger and T1, T2, T3 are sequentially increasing sizes of cancer. And then if there is N1 or beyond movement, it means that the cancer has actually managed to get into the lymph glands, at least at this level, if not a little bit further. That's stage two breast cancer. Stage three breast cancer is all getting a bit worse. So larger tumors, more lymph glands involved, more extensive lymph glands involved, perhaps going up into um, your, your neck. So this is, this is still regarded as early breast cancer, and this is stage three breast cancer. A variant of stage three breast cancer is inflammatory breast cancer. And I would just like to say, in, in the last couple of years, there's been a bit of a, I'm not sure why, but there's been a little bit of a scare in the community that when women hear that they've got inflammatory breast cancer uh, or hear that term, they are extremely frightened because there's this overriding message in the community that inflammatory breast cancer is a death sentence. Incorrect. Inflammatory breast cancer is a clinical diagnosis and it's actually made by the eyes of the surgeon or the oncologist. It's not a pathological diagnosis. It's not a radiological diagnosis. And yes, it often is um, associated with a more aggressive cancer. But if the cancer is inflammatory in the breast for the first time and all the scans are clear to suggest there is no spread to other organs, inflammatory breast cancer is still regarded as stage three breast cancer. So again, I think you know, the, the, the very few women that get told they have an inflammatory breast cancer need to be aware it is not a death sentence. It, there are still uh, you know, many, many um, uh, evidence that shows that you can treat this aggressively and you can cure women with inflammatory breast cancer. Then we go to metastatic breast cancer. And metastatic breast cancer is a spectrum. But the diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer essentially means uh, no matter what the size of the cancer is in the breast, no matter whether the lymph glands in the armpit are involved or not, there is evidence proven that the cancer has spread and gone to other organs. There is no particular organ that always gets spread of breast cancer, as some people think. It must always go to the liver. It must always go to the bone. If it goes to a particular organ, you know, it's a better prognosis. It's a worse prognosis. I really, really want to teach you not to think of it that way because there are a number of factors that um, impact on whether a stage four breast cancer patient's cancer spread is better or worse. And it doesn't just rely on the organ that the cancer goes to, and neither does it uh, depend solely on how much of that organ is involved. Having said that, many of you will be aware that breast cancer cells like going to particular organs. They do like going to the bones. They do like going to the liver and the lung. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, for some patients, they do like going to the brain. Essentially, breast cancer cells can go to any single part of your body. I have seen it in every single organ that has living tissue. So that means you can't get breast cancer in your hair. <laughs> but beyond that, I have seen breast cancer in every single organ and in every single tissue of the body. Any questions? Okay, I'm, I'm gonna repeat the questions just for the filming. So the question was, are we keeping statistics on uh, advanced metastatic breast cancer? Uh, as many of you know, we do keep statistics on early breast cancer. The answer is yes, but the statistics is very variable. Uh, I think one of the things that some of you will know who, who've known me for a long time is we pride on us, ourselves as having kept statistics on metastatic breast cancer for 20 years. Uh, and we have a very, very strong data set. We've published on this, and I'll talk to you a little bit about a study that we're in the middle of doing at the moment. I think one of the difficulties in keeping statistics is what statistics is relevant. And I think probably the things as a community of patients um, uh, touched by stage four breast cancer is you want to know 
what is the incidence of stage four breast cancer? In other words, are we doing a, a bad job and there are more women getting stage four breast cancer? Two, and I think this is really important, is are stage four breast cancers getting the best evidence-based treatment? Because if they are, you know with confidence that that's going to be reflected in best outcome and survival. And that's the third bit of information you want to get, is what is the survival of women with stage four breast cancer? Uh, you know, who are the patients who need more attention and which are the groups of women who are doing really well? Um, unfortunately, it's very hard to collect that data um, on both a institutional level or a national level because, number one, um, you have to have a, a complete agreement into what kind of information is, is collected. And I can just say you, no one ever agrees on that. Two, it actually is a very important um, uh, aspect. The data has to be con uh, collected consistently and accurately, and no one does that really very well. I think cancer registries, the Cancer Council, the hospital cancer registries that I was involved in, the public hospitals, they try their best in collecting at least the incidence. So how many cases of metastatic breast cancer do they see a year? Um, and they do that, I think, reasonably well. But I think in terms of the outcome data, in terms of how long does a metastatic breast cancer patient live for, you know, what are the cure rates? What are the complete, complete remission rates? Um, nobody collects really good data for that. Uh, but you can, you know, if you're interested, you can certainly look at um, some of the databases that come out of the big cancer centers in the US, which, you know, in a sense uh, is a bit similar to what happens in Australia. But one of the things that we certainly um, will be doing and will be, uh, and will be making available to the community is statistics. And given that um, uh, I've seen now over 4,500 patients with breast cancer, over 1,000 uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer, we have a very rich data set. Um, and we're doing ongoing uh, research with that. So this information will come out. Sometimes it doesn't reach your attention because it gets published in medical journals. But I think one of the things that we've certainly talked about within the group is that you know, our website is used a lot for access to information. So we're going to make this information available to you on the website. In the short answer, the question was, um, nurses have advised uh, you that uh, breast cancer going to the bones is better than going to other places like the brain. Okay. The short answer is yes, uh, but the, you can't make a general statement like that because I have a, a number of women with brain metastases which have been treated in remission and they're actually dying and progressing of bone disease. It's all about the pace and the biology and the response and the volume. So for any woman who has both disease in the brain or the bone or the bone and the liver or the bone and somewhere else, it's a question of what's the volume, what's the impact on her quality of life, has she got a complication of the bone disease, i.e. fractures, pressure on spinal cord, other things like that. So, you know, the bone uh, is a very common site for spread. It can be a blessing in some women. Uh, many of the women that are, are, are cured have had only bone disease, but it can be absolutely devastating and the life threatening uh, sight of disease for many others. So, it, you know, to make a general statement is actually incorrect. Okay. Now, now you have to start concentrating, all right? Because I'm going to show you pictures. Um, so, what's new in treatment for metastatic breast cancer? I'm going to give you molecular biology 101. I'm then going to talk to you about CGK inhibitors because many of you in the room are on CGK inhibitors and I'm going to give you an update. And I'm going to give you a little bit more information about immunotherapy because unfortunately um, with the advances that immunotherapy has made for other cancers, particularly melanoma, uh, lung cancer, uh, there has been a bit of an overwhelming community sort of uh, response to immunotherapy is the drug for the future, and therefore, you know, for breast cancer patients, this is the, the area that we want to go into. Yes and no. It's all about biology. Okay, so this is um, a cartoon of the nucleus that I showed you a real picture of. That's the cell it sits in. That's the surface of the cell. And remember, this isn't a two-dimensional uh, picture, but it's a three-dimensional um, uh, uh, organ. And on it are a number of self-surface proteins. Some of the proteins are little divots, like little doors into the, into the cell. Others just sit there waiting to be um, activated to do its job. And what does it do? 
the simplest way I can describe this is that every cell, and this includes your normal cell, but obviously our talk is focused on uh, breast cancer cells, will have the ability for something sitting outside the cell, which is called a signaling molecule, make contact with one of these self-surface uh, entities, whether it be a receptor or one of these little protein blobs that sit on the outside. On making contact, it changes that protein on its surface. And essentially, if it's going to help that cell to grow, it will either internalize and move the whole thing into the cell, or it starts a cascade of reactions, a little bit like an atomic reaction. And as it goes down into the cell heading towards the nucleus, these steps all sequentially go towards inciting the nucleus of the cell to grow. That's breast cancer in a nutshell. One of my patients showed me a picture that she'd been given, um, and uh, this is pertinent to breast cancer, so this is um, specifically, and it's really, as she said to me, it's a bit like an electrical board, uh, and that's how you've got to think of it. So the first slide I just showed you then was a single line um, signaling pathway, but within your cancer cell, and that's why these cells are so complex, so uh, difficult to treat uniformly, is that you may start off with one of the receptors being excited. It talks to molecules inside the cell, and it goes down this cascade to stimulating your, your nucleus of your cancer to grow. But in the meantime, as all of this is happening, there are other circuitry in your cancer cell that speaks into it to either hype it up or, in some instances, slow it down. At the same time, as this cascade is going on, the cascade incites other circulatory to get hyped up. So these circulatory may not have been excited by something on the surface, but the inside circuitry excites neighborhood circuitry. And this is a dynamic process. It's going on every single second of your life. Um, and some of these pathways tell the cancer to stop. Some of these pathways say, hey, let's get some of the um, immune system in your body to come and help the cancer cell grow. Some of the signals incite your immune cells to come and help it kill the cancer. Some of these uh, circuitry tells the blood vessels around the cancer cell to grow faster, to supply more oxygen and nutrients to the cancer. And then we are also understanding that even the supportive tissue around the cancer <coughs> cell can be impacted on by the circuitry within the cancer cell, and it's all changing the environment to help make the cancer easier to survive, easier to grow, easier to spread, easier to get into the bloodstream. So this is what we're dealing with. And specifically for breast cancer, I think many of you will be familiar with uh, some of these terms, um, HER2, estrogen receptor. And just to give you a sort of a, a summary, the, probably the most important um, uh, proteins, receptors, and pathways that we utilize to treat your cancer are the ones that I've indicated there. Some are on the surface, some are on the surface and get internalized. Some of the treatment, specifically the CDK inhibitors, work here at the nucleus level, and there are other drugs that target other things in the middle. And what are those drugs? These are the, the, the key players. So some of you are on these drugs, some of you will have heard of these drugs, but essentially all those drugs I've shown you in the orange splash are the drugs that work at different points in that cell uh, growth to try and uh, make the cell stop growing. So it's really, really ingenious. And at this point, I'll just put in a plug for evidence-based medicine. It has taken 10, 20, 30 years of thousands and thousands of scientists and clinicians and uh, pharmaceutical companies and uh, research centers to get to this kind of level. There is not even a 1% comparison with complementary therapies. So although complementary therapies you know, are said to, sp uh, to cost, uh, I think, more than $5 billion a year uh, in terms of what people pay in Australia, there is not even an inkling of this degree of finesse of scientific research that supports the use of, of the b vast bulk of complementary therapies. So very specifically for um, the CDK inhibitors, because these are exactly the group of drugs that has been uh, researched and developed based on our understanding of um, uh, molecular biology. And um, so just to tell you, because I, I do get asked, um, how do CDK inhibitors work? Many of you may not care, 
but uh, seeing I have been asked this and I was asked to speak about this too, I'll just spend a couple of minutes on this. So the CDK protein kinases um, and the cyclin proteins are very, very important in making the, the nucleus of the cell grow. So this picture where it says it's starting from um, uh, G1 through to M is growth phase, um, synthetic phase, mitotic phase, and then the cell doubles. So what happens is that the CDK proteins and the cyclin proteins are very, very important in allowing this, <coughs> this to happen in a circular fashion. And an important component of that is a protein called the retinoblastoma protein. And so the finding of this was that if we could interrupt the, comp the complexing of cyclin D with particularly cyclin D kinase 4 and 6, because these are really important guys in breast cancer, you can actually interrupt this and make the cancer cell die. And before I move on to talking about CDK inhibitors, I just want to give you a few terms because I think uh, there's been a little bit of, I think, <coughs> social uh, media as well as marketing to, to uh, inform the community that CDK inhibitors now, for a few of the trials, have actually proven to show an overall survival benefit. Um, and many of you know that any drug that can actually pr improve the overall survival of a stage four breast cancer gets a lot of attention. But I just want to give you um, a little bit of uh, teaching about the terminology. Because when drugs are evaluated for stage four breast cancer, almost uniformly, the, the, the first outcome that we want to measure for that new drug is called PFS, progression-free survival. What does that mean? It means how long can that drug keep the patient alive without the cancer progressing. So from time point one, you start the drug. At the point you die, that's your PFS. At the point the cancer grows and starts spreading or getting bigger, that's your PFS, all right? Now, you can probably estimate that if you have a drug that can prolong a woman's PFS, it's likely to prolong her overall survival. Not always, because one of the beauties about uh, stage four breast cancer, which I find is what keeps me going all the time, is that there are a number of drugs beyond the first treatment. So if a woman's had a good response to the first drug and it's no longer working, there's usually a number of drugs I have in my um, armamentarium to offer that patient. So if you only measure what the PFS of that patient's survival is with drug one, you can't basically account for what the effects of drug two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven are, because that's what's going to impact on the overall survival of that patient. Overall survival is pretty obvious. It's from the time point you measure the person's alive to the time point you measure that they're dead. When we report results, we don't report average. And it's a really important distinction because this should give you a lot of confidence. And average means that if you have 100 patients and they have each lived a certain number of months, you add up all those months that they all collectively lived and you divide it by 100. The median, which is what we generally report in um, uh, cancer, including other cancers beyond breast cancer, is how long does the 50th percent patient live for? So you may find that out of 100 women, 49 will live for 12 months. The 50th person lives for 12 and a half months. And then the next 49 can live for 13 months to 13 years. And that's much more important information than averaging it out. All right, so when you see a result, if uh, your oncologist recommends for you to have a drug because it's improved the median survival, it's actually more meaningful information for you than saying it improved the average survival. The next thing, if you are interested in looking at papers, and I know many, many of you access the internet, but I'm feeling confident that those of you who I've got to have not been accessing Dr. Google as much. Because as I've said to you before, he never got a medical degree. If you're going to look at results where there is a 95% conf confidence interval given to you, what it means is that they've told you for that drug treatment what the median survival is, 12 months, 
And then in the brackets after that, where they say the 95% confidence interval, it's the number of months where they can confidently tell you that 95% of those women in that trial would have lived for. So if you have a median survival of 12 months and the confidence interval is 11 months to 15 months, you know that the data is really tight and it's really quite believable. If you have a median survival of 12 months and the 95th confidence interval is two weeks to 20 months, it means that the results are still believable, but this drug works very differently in different patients. So it absolutely does nothing much for some, but it does a lot for the other end, but it still ends up giving the same median. Okay? So what are the cyclin D kinase inhibitors in metastatic breast cancer? These are the pivotal trials that led to these drugs being approved in many, many, many countries. And all I really want to point out to you is, uh, and this is an important point because it's relevant for some of you in the audience, is that essentially the trials uniformly showed that when you combine one of the cyclin D kinase inhibitors with an aromatase inhibitor, so that is letrozole, anastrozole, or exemestane, you basically doubled the woman's progression-free survival. This included younger women, because in younger women, they can't just have an aromatase inhibitor. Younger women have to have the ovaries blocked with something called a GNRH, and then they get onto a, an aromatase inhibitor. A number of studies have also combined cyclin D kinase inhibitors with another hormone drug called fulvestrant. Um, and again, you can see that the improvement is very similar to that when um, cyclin D kinases were included with an aromatase inhibitor. But in women who were entered into this trial, they actually got into this trial because their cancer had already progressed on an aromatase inhibitor by itself. And I'll talk to you about what the relevance of these results are for women in Australia in a minute. Thirdly, there is one cyclin D kinase inhibitor which has just gone onto the PBS three weeks ago, so that's a pleasing result, which showed that if you use it just by itself without any hormone partners, it can also improve outcomes. So what's new for those of you who have a photographic memory from last year. This is now CDK inhibitors in 2020. And the new thing is that all three um, cyclin D kinase inhibitors are now available in Australia. So that is ribocyclib, palbocyclib, and abemocyclib. However, you will only get access to that and have Medicare pay for it if those, one of those three drugs is combined with letrozole or anastrozole. So, can women access cyclin DK inhibitors if they've already received a, a hormone drug in the first line setting? Essentially, no, unless the first drug you got in the uh, metastatic setting was tamoxifen. So if you've already received one of these letrozole, anastrozole, or exemestane, and you then want to get onto CTK inhibitors, you can't access it on the PBS. You can pay for it. Uh, it's roughly $33,000. Um, and if you can afford that and get the benefits from that, there is now a, um, an access program that will provide the drug for you for free after that first eight months or so. And these drugs are so exciting and so effective that they are now being evaluated in other types of breast cancers. So um, currently they're only available for women whose cancers are hormone positive, HER2 negative, but there are a number of studies now being done in hormone positive, HER2 positive breast cancer, and there are now uh, nearly um, over 10,000 women that will be ultimately recruited to early breast cancer trials. Um, and we're really excited because we've been involved in all three of these trials. So I have no doubts in a couple of years when we talk about this uh, drug, a family of drugs, we're going to know that a number of women in Australia, and particularly those that have been uh, treated by us, will have benefited from higher cure rates because they were involved in these trials. So I'm just going to show you what the difference is. So this is one of those trials that showed that there was um, a uh, improvement in progression-free survival. So the blue line are all the women in the trial that got palbocyclib and letrozole. The women in the trial, and this is about a 666 patient trial, got just letrozole and a placebo. 
So if you look at the median survival of the women who only got letrozole, it's about 13 and a half months. If you look at the women who got the palbocyclib and letrozole, it's sitting out here beyond two years. But look at this, there are still women responding beyond that. And the reason why each of these curves have got these little vertical lines are, is that although this particular woman only uh, 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 did well up until six months, it isn't meaning to say that, that other women in that group uh, didn't do better longer because they've only been on the drug for six months. So the little blue, uh, vertical lines tell you how women who are still on the drug are faring, but we don't know whether they're going to live longer and do better because they actually haven't been on the drug for that long. That's what that, that curve means. This is the overall survival curve of one of the, the trials, and this is with the drug ribocyclin. So the overall survival, median survival for the women who didn't get uh, the ribocyclin and only got full vestrin is about three and a bit years. For those who got uh, ribocyclob and full vestrin, they haven't actually reached the median survival. How encouraging is that? So you may all be thinking, why can't we access this combination of the PBS? Excellent question. Right to your local members. Are there any questions? Not just maybe of uh, CDK inhibitors, but uh, anything on the biology? Yeah. Good question. So the question was, there are a lot of clinical trials uh, investing into women in the first line setting, uh, but very, very few second, third, fourth, fifth line. And that's a really good question, and I'll give you my honest answer to that. The first thing is that once you've got a group of women who have received treatment and their cancer has progressed, it is actually technically very difficult to get a what we call homogeneous or very similar group of women so that you can test a second drug. Because if you have a group of women who have received type A and a couple of those uh, responded to type A for five years before the cancer progressed, put those women into a second line trial. And then you've got a couple of a few women who've been on the same drug and the cancer grew on that drug after six weeks. You put them into a trial for a second drug. You kind of expect you're going to get a different response in the second line setting. So it becomes very technically difficult at any one time point, at any one institution, or even if it's a multi-center international trial, to get women all very similarly treated in the first line setting to evaluate a second drug. But clearly, the full Western story, they did that. They actually had a whole group of women who had only received an aromatase inhibitor. Uh, they involved a lot of centers around the world, a lot of expense, a lot of work, and they actually collected a group of women, a few hundred, that were all treated very similarly in the first line so they could evaluate it in the second line. If you then have a group of women in the second line who have now progressed and they need a third treatment, it's getting progressively harder and harder to find a homogeneous group of patients. So that's probably one of the most important things. The second thing, and it may come from cynicism because I've been doing this for so long, is that pharmaceutical companies invest a lot of money in trying to prove that their drugs work, but they want to go with where the money's going to be. So if it's going to be harder to prove that their drug works, they are going to be less likely to invest the money and the time and the effort into that. So how about non-pharmaceutical researchers? Yes, we can do that, but you will find almost uh, nobody in Australia, a, a few people in the States, but it's a conflict of interest. There are going to be no clinical oncologists who are going to be responsible for patenting a new drug to then be responsible for evaluating that new drug. So there's a sort of a mismatch in the ability to create a new drug and then finding the population of patients and the hospitals to do that trial in. Um, but I think, you know, that isn't the end of the story, and I think that's something that's really, really important in terms of collecting data, um, as was the earlier question, because if you have um, institutions that collect data on what happens to their patients after the first line, second line, third line, fourth line, you actually get a picture of what works and what doesn't work. So we're gonna be publishing our study, hopefully, by next year, and that is one of the big questions that we're going to be actually addressing in that. Okay, so a little bit is practical. Uh, Palbocyclib was the one that was first uh, approved in Australia, and so that's the first one. Ribocyclib uh, came about uh, only last year, and abemocyclib only got approved three weeks ago. So essentially, um, it's a really good question because that's what pharmaceutical companies ask all the time. 
with the implication, how can we make oncologists use our CDK inhibitor? And essentially, when I give talks, I, I say to people, you've got to look at the patient. Um, each of these three CDK inhibitors have slightly different side effect profiles. They have got slightly different um, scheduling of medications, and there's a slightly different way of following up side effects of these drugs. So what I do is I look at my patient, I look at what side effects and symptoms she already has had, um, I look at whether she has other health issues, particularly cardiac, because ribocyclib has a very, very small possibility of affecting uh, heart rhythm, although it's getting increasingly rare for this to be seen. Um, and I also ask patients, you know, I, having said, you know, these are the side effects of drug A and drug B, some will say to me, Aline, I've had so many problems with infections in the past, I really want to have the CDK inhibitor that is going to have the lo lowest chance of, you know, lowering my white cell count. So palbocyclib tends to lower your white cell count more than ribocyclib. So it, you know, I think there may come a time when all these three drugs are on the market that someone is brave enough to do a head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, but that isn't going to happen anytime soon. Um, and so a lot of the, 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 the actual clinical utility is really based on your knowledge. And really, oncologists need to know the ins and outs of all three drugs in all three trials so they can actually make the best decision for their patient. <coughs> okay, so immunotherapy. This is a picture of how cancer can in, in, uh, involve your immune system for its own benefit. And then I'm going to show you how immunotherapies work. So cancer cells can actually release proteins, and these proteins incite your own immune cells to help it. In the process of the cancer cells uh, creating these proteins, they need your own cells to present these proteins to your lymph nodes that make the uh, immune cells to help it. So there's actually a potential point here that as a therapeutic intervention we could interfere with. Once the cancer cell has made your immune cells primed, these cells then go out and they can prime other cells to help it uh, um, encourage your cancer cell to grow. But sometimes along the way, this immune reaction actually makes your immune cells hyped up, turned on, switched on to kill the cancer. So this is where um, immunotherapies work for breast cancer. A lot of you probably don't know, but chemotherapy can induce an immune effect. We see this all the time. So chemotherapy has actually been considered that one of the reasons why it can be effective, and particularly more effective in some patients than others, example, triple negative breast cancer, is that the chemotherapy kills the cancer cell itself, but it also induces and in, uh, excites your immune function to help uh, the chemotherapy kill your cancer. But clearly, the, the biggest area of, his, uh, of research is with the actual immunotherapies itself. And what these um, drugs do is they interfere in the process of the immune cells helping the cancer to grow. And that's probably the easiest way of me um, stating it. Okay, no more pictures. Side effects. I want to squash a myth that immunotherapy is natural. And because it's not chemotherapy, it's really safe and has no side effects. Because that's not true. It has different side effects to chemotherapy. Now, I don't want to frighten you all, so this is not meant to be a scary slide. This is meant to be an educational slide that immunotherapy certainly can have side effects and it can affect a number of different organs and then produce the symptoms in you. And essentially, the reason why immunotherapy have side effects is that sometimes, unintentionally, the immunotherapy has an impact on your own immune cells to make your immune cells attack a normal organ in your body. So your uh, uh, normal skin cells, the lining of your gut, your lungs, your kidneys, kidneys, your liver, and even your own immune system can be inadvertently uh, excited by the immunotherapy to damage those particular organs. So people on immunotherapy, and some of you might be on some of my immunotherapy trials, you know, we need to be really carefully monitoring for these sorts of side effects because sometimes it actually leads to the drug having to be stopped, just as much as chemotherapy needs to be stopped if it's causing too many side effects. And it's really because of this potential for self-damage. The second thing which is really important, uh, particularly for those of you who are on and, and considering um, immunotherapies, is this new condition called pseudoprogression. 
So many of you will be very um, uh, familiar with the fact that to monitor you, um, you know, you will be having scans to see whether your cancer spots are getting uh, less, uh, are getting smaller and less dark and so forth. And when things are getting smaller and getting less dark, we are pretty confident that the drugs are working. With immunotherapy, there are a number of studies now showing that you can actually have patients responding to the immunotherapy, but the standard way that we measure what's happening to your cancer spots is actually showing that it's progressing. So this is a picture of a patient who started uh, treatment with a cancer spot in the lung that size. One and a half months later, on immunotherapy, it got bigger. Five months later, it got bigger again. But we recognize this syndrome, so the patient continued to receive the immunotherapy during all this time. And finally, just short of nine months, the cancer spots started to shrink. So, you know, many of you will want to ask your oncologist, how big is the spot in the liver? What's happening to the one that's in the left lung? So you've got to be very careful. If you're on immunotherapy, do not be dismayed if your oncologist actually says it's a bit bigger. And we have standard ways of monitoring and uh, making uh, an assessment of whether it's pseudo progression, which is false progression, or whether it's real progression. So I think my take home message for immunotherapy for breast cancer, it is cr you know, al uh, almost certainly going to be a very exciting uh, new uh, class of agents to be used, but really uh, uh, to be reserved uh, for future treatments um, and currently only involved in clinical trials. And I think it's really important for the community to understand we are going to have very similar issues with immunotherapy as we have had with hormone drugs and chemotherapy because we've got to decide which breast cancer patients are going to do the best with immunotherapy and therefore should be receiving that. Secondly, how do we access these drugs? They are enormously expensive, uh, and there is not one single immune therapy tri uh, drug available on the PBS at the moment for breast cancer. Thirdly, um, and there is certainly a lot of evidence to support this, is that you will probably get the best bang for your buck with immune therapy if it's combined with chemotherapy or something else. So please don't be under the impression that once immunotherapy is available, there goes the side effects and the concerns about chemotherapy. Probably won't be the case. And then more importantly is how do we know it's working? You know, with the pseudo progression, the length of time it takes for us to know whether things are working well or not. Uh, uh, how do we know that we're treating uh, patients correctly? So we've got to do a lot of work on that. And then lastly, we, know we, we absolutely have to know how to manage side effects. And ideally, we want to be able to stop side effects from occurring uh, uh, rather than allowing things uh, to occur for women to suffer symptoms and then having to, to be concerned about it. Any questions? So the question was, Breast cancer spreads to other organs, and that's why we call it metastatic stage four breast cancer. Can it happen in the reverse? It can't happen in the reverse because if a cancer originates in the liver and then goes into the breast, which never happens, I've never seen a case for that, it's still called liver cancer. Now, I have seen a patient with kidney cancer where the kidney cancer cells went into the breast, but you call that patient kidney cancer with stage four metastatic disease in the breast. So the way you, you, you define a patient is always, what is the organ of the cell of origin? If it was breast cancer at the beginning, it remains breast ca cancer no matter which organ it goes into. So, I mean, I know some, some of you will talk about, you know, my bone cancer is doing this or my liver cancer is doing that, and that's, you know, that doesn't matter. But you don't have bone cancer, you don't have liver cancer. You have breast cancer in the bones, you have breast cancer in the liver. Okay, so what would make a patient ineligible for immunotherapy treatment? At the moment, and again, this is based on research, the groups of women most likely to respond to immunotherapy are those who have triple negative breast cancer. So the cancer cell doesn't respond to hormone treatment, it doesn't respond to Herceptin trastuzumab drugs. And that's because that's the group of women that seem to derive the benefit. So if you've got metastatic breast cancer and yours is ER positive, you won't be eligible for most of the immunotherapy trials at the moment. Uh, having uh, said that, there are trials in early breast cancer, and I mentioned that we're doing one of those, where they're now starting to evaluate immune therapy for ER positive breast cancer. Now, if you have triple negative breast cancer, so you're in the group that immunotherapy might be beneficial for, you still have to fulfill a number of criteria to get into the trials. 
uh, uh, we've got three immunotherapy trials at the moment. One of them requires you to have triple negative breast cancer in the liver. If you don't have it in the liver, you're not eligible because they're asking a specific question. Uh, another one, we think we've just taken the last spot internationally, so I won't talk more about that, but it's been a really effective drug, and I'm hoping to give you some results next year. And we've got a third trial now that, again, is only suitable for triple negative breast cancer patients. But like the earlier question, it's reserved for women in the first line setting. The company determines that. So the immunotherapy, virtually every drug, I'm just trying to think if there isn't any, any time a new drug is being evaluated, it will always be initiated by a drug company. Having said that, it's all above board because drug companies don't have access to patients. They're not doctors. So what they have to do is they have to recruit and involve and um, have you know, breast cancer specialists who know the signs and believe that their drug is effective to come aboard to put patients on trials and do the work. So although a drug company funds the drug development, funds the drug trial, it's the doctors, the uh, breast tr uh, trials unit, the staff, nursing, and patients who actually answer the question whether the drug works or not. The drug company doesn't do that. We do that. Some of you are not going to like what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. I know what you say about me when I'm not in the room. <laughs> I've actually been told by a few of you that you go out and have coffee and you go off and say, oh, did I talk to you about your weight? Did I talk to you about your weight? Did she say that you had to lose weight? I'm doing this for you. It's out of love and care, all right? So even if you don't like what I'm going to tell you, you got to hear it. <laughs> okay. What data do we have about alcohol? So I think this is a really good um, sort of overall, uh, and this comes back to data collection study that was actually presented at San Antonio uh, last uh, December. And what these guys did at the Mayo Clinic, which is uh, in uh, America, was they looked at um, a survey that had been done on over 7,500 women that had been involved in their screening mammogram uh, program. And what they did was they had a detailed questionnaire for all these women, and one of the things that they asked them was about alcohol intake. So what they ended up doing was they selected out 2,500 women who were actually found as a result of the screening mammogram to have cancer, and then over 5,000 who uh, didn't have cancer. And so they very much tried to look at the age of the women, the ethnic group. Uh, it looked at mammography machines to make sure they were actually being detected at the same rates. And you can see um, that they actually ended up with a pretty sort of matched group of patients. So um, women were about 57 years of age, uh, a lowish BMI, uh, about a third were premenopausal younger women. And this was the sprinkling of alcohol intake. And this is standard drinks uh, per day. So they did a good job having collected data on you know, over 7,500 patients to see that the cases of breast cancer were matched with those that didn't have cancer. And this is the salient result. Overall, and if you, if you know anything about statistics, if you get a p-value which has a decimal place, a zero, and then another zero, you know this is a significant result, okay? So overall, as the drinking intake of women increased, so did significantly the risk of getting breast cancer. If they just picked the premenopausal women, and now look at this, instead of having 6,500 women, you've got about 1,600 women, so they're smaller numbers, and now you see it's a 0.13. So this is not statistically significant, but if you look at the figures, you know, there's still a higher incidence of breast cancer occurring uh, when uh, women are drinking. But certainly the group, and this has been shown by other investigators, that have the highest risk of breast cancer if they're drinkers are postmenopausal women. Now, I've shown you this in terms of a big study showing the impact of alcohol in developing breast cancer. 
but there are much smaller studies, but also consistently showing that in metastatic breast cancer, um, the um, intake of alcohol can be directly related to prognosis. But again, this is a much more difficult group of women to evaluate because you've got to look at the alcohol intake and then you've got to look at what type of breast cancer they have, then you've got to look at what drugs they're on and so forth. But as a general rule of thumb, if you've got um, metastatic breast cancer, particularly if you are postmenopausal, um, I would always generally recommend that you are not drinking. Um, my, my threshold is less than three standard drinks per week. Okay? Now, just one sentence on smoking. Because this is a really vexed area, um, certainly up to about five years ago, smoking wasn't considered a risk factor for breast cancer. Um, but there's been a lot of studies now um, conflicted. So there are some that say definitely doesn't cause breast cancer and others that say definitely increases risk of breast cancer. So I think as a, healthy, as a health signal, most health authorities are now suggesting that smoking, which is a bad habit for other aspects of your body anyway, can also be implicated in increasing the risk of association with breast cancer. And what I say to, to ladies with advanced breast cancer is, you know, if you continue to smoke, you invariably put yourself at a much higher risk of getting chest infections. So forget about whether smoking worsens your prognosis or not, it's just gonna worsen how you feel. It's gonna make you more likely to get chest infections and end up in hospital. So if for nothing else, stop smoking. Exercise. Survival is improved, um, and when I say this, it is in studies that have tried to control for other things, but again, it, it's, it is a difficult area to evaluate, but I think one of the things that you're probably all very familiar with is that if you exercise regularly, you tend to be of a good body weight, you tend to have a healthier diet, uh, and you tend to have less alcohol. So those are all very positive associations. So I'm um, pretty confident that exercise alone is a, a good thing for metastatic breast cancer survival uh, and would generally encourage people to do that. And there's obviously a lot of data showing that exercise with the endorphins that it causes can actually make you feel happier, sleep better, and all those other good you know, mood effects. Lastly, obesity. So this again um, is a, a relatively recent study, uh, but I chose it because it's the big, one of the biggest meta-analyses um, that's been published. So they looked at 43 studies collecting information over the last uh, 40 years. And of those 43 studies, some only had 100 patients, but some had them up to 400,000 patients. So you know, combining all the information from this, these studies are really important. And what the studies did was they looked at the, the um, BMI of patients. They, in some of the studies, they measured waist-hip ratio. And essentially, uniformly, when you look at all of them, it showed that if you are obese with a BMI of 30 and above, you have a 33% higher risk of dying from breast cancer. And this is what's called a forest plot. And all you need to know is if you look at all the studies to the right of the vertical line, these are all the studies that uniformly tell you that obesity is associated with a worse prognosis. So there are four that says it doesn't. But if you look at the black line, that's the 95% confidence interval, all of them, except for that little tiny study, crosses the black line. So it says, well, this study said obesity didn't make things worse, but hey, some of the women, it did make it worse. So weight loss for um, metastatic breast cancer is an important lifestyle thing that you guys can impact on and the community can impact on. And then complementary therapies. This was a great poster at um, San Antonio meeting. Um, the people at the Yale Medical School, um, it was a, a relatively small study, but they did it really well, was they looked at patients that had been diagnosed over about a 12 year period who actually confessed and admitted that they were using non-conventional complementary uh, breast cancer treatment. And what they did was showed, number one, that there was a little bit of dip in 2006, I have no idea why, but overall there's a bit of a trend that women are using more and more complementary therapies. And to make it really clean, what they did was they selected out the women who use complementary therapies only to get a really clear view of 
What happens if you have evidence-based conventional treatment? What happens if you have complementary therapy? And what they found was this. Now, even from the back of the room, I think you can see the difference between the survival of the group that had proper treatment and the survival of the group that had poor treatment. And look at this, the P is so small, they can't even put zeros on it. What they did was they said, okay, is this just because you've included too many metastatic breast cancer patients in it? So you've skewed it a bit. So what they did was they broke it up, what stage of the cancer was. So you, if you have early stage one and two breast cancer, you have conventional treatment, you are doing swimmingly better than those that opt for complementary therapies. How about stage three? Swimmingly better. These ladies are dying. Oh, sorry, that was the one before. <coughs> sorry, I didn't do a three. So these are stage four breast cancer patients. So women with stage four breast cancer, stage three was very similar to one and two. Uh, so stage four breast cancer women are dying as early as six months from diagnosis. Now, many of you who have been motivated enough to come and uh, attend this meeting would probably think, who in their right mind would choose complementary therapy either alone or together with conventional therapy? Well, some of you may also think, well, Arlene, a lot of us do. Can I just suggest, you know, complementary therapies to be used alone has no evidence based. So I absolutely categorically say that that's the wrong thing to do. If you want to consider having conventional treatment, but you also want to do complementary therapy on the side, can I just please encourage you to talk with your oncologist? Always be upfront and transparent. You know, that you, you are the one that gets harmed if you're taking something that could potentially make the conventional treatment less effective. Questions on lifestyle factors. So the question was, um, recent uh, publications suggested that stress at a laboratory level, um, and obviously you've got to look at how they stressed um, the animals and the cells, can actually help uh, cells grow, even though there is uh, very little data to say that stress can actually cause cancer in its own right. My take home line is that it wouldn't surprise me if the chemical and hormonal changes that happens in a person's body changes at periods of heightened physical, emotional, or psychological stress. It would, would not surprise me. I mean, we all know, you know, when you're anxious, your pulse rate goes up. Why does it do that? Because your adrenaline levels go up and other, and other hormones and, and uh, chemicals. Um, you know that when you're stressed, you're more likely to get colds and cold sores. You know, so you can't measure what effect a stress uh, event has on your immune system, but it clearly has something to do with generalized resistance to viruses and so forth. So it wouldn't surprise me that some form of stress would have potentially a detrimental effect on cancer growth. Having said that, it's a really hard thing to measure. You know, if someone is having difficulties with their job, you know, they've lost a loved one, how can you reverse that? How can you tell them not to be stressed and emotionally upset? So what I try to encourage uh, all my ladies to do, and we now have uh, the ability of having uh, Amanda, our advanced breast cancer nurse, and Mary Scott, our clinical psychologist, all part of our team, to try and address that issue. You know, how can we help women at all stages of breast cancer um, recognize the stress that they're experiencing, uh, deal with the stresses, and I think that actually is something that families, loved ones, and carers can have an active role in as well. Because sad to say, um, the stress often comes from not within, but is from without. Uh, and I wish I could have a magical way that I could wipe out the stresses that some husbands, children, parents cause my patients, but I can't. Um, but it doesn't, you know, it's probably not, it's, just, it's common sense to you guys that that is probably something that would me make it healthier and better for the patient involved. Um, so, I hope that answers your question. Any other questions on lifestyle? Very quiet in terms of lifestyle questions. <laughs> you, you don't have to confess anything, you know, personally. I'm, I'm not going to remember who asked the question. <laughs> okay. Tumor marker. For many of you, you know that I talk to you about your tumor markers. Uh, for many of you, you know that your tumor marker is measured when you have blood tests. 
Uh, for many of you, you know that your moments of joy and your moments of distress comes because of the tumor marker result. I don't know that I'm going to be able to say anything that's going to change your attitude, but I just want to put it into perspective because I know I say this to you individually, so I'm going to say it to you as a group. So first of all, what is a breast cancer tumor marker? So this is a cartoon picture of a cancer cell in the process of mitosis, and it has little proteins on its surface. So the tumor marker that we use in Australia is a little protein that sits on the surface of the cancer. To date, we don't think it does anything. So it's not like my molecular biology slide where I say a protein on the surface gets excited and causes your cancer cell to grow. This protein does not. It is a bystander protein. It's actually called a muck protein. And what it does is it sits on the cell of some women with breast cancer and it gets dislodged. Now, why does it get dislodged? Well, it get, might get dislodged because there's just so many cancer cells growing and growing. They jostle each other and release a lot of this protein into the blood, so your levels might go up. It might be that the treatment that you're on is actively killing the cancer. So in the process of killing the cancer, these little protein uh, molecules get released into the bloodstream. So that's what I tell you when I tell you you've got a tumor flare. I think the drugs are working. The fact that your tumor marker has gone up doesn't alarm me. This is a protein, and it's not a unique protein. So almost every single individual will have other proteins in your blood that the laboratory, no matter which laboratory it is, will pick up another protein in your blood that looks like the CA15-3 and tells you that your tumor marker is going up. So that's a false elevation of a tumor marker. And there's no way really of measuring that protein separately to this protein. Can it harm you? One molecule of CA15-3 has been best measured as 0 0.26 angstrom. That's another unit of measure. How much is an angstrom? 10 million angstrom are needed to make one millimeter, which is that. So this CA15-3 protein is tiny. It doesn't harm you. And no matter how high the level gets, it will not be a danger. And my highest level is 653,000. So, no, it has no harm for effect. Are higher levels dangerous? No. Can it be measured in every breast cancer patient? It's rarely elevated in early breast cancer, and it can vary from 30 to 80% in metastatic breast cancer patients. And in, there are certainly instances and, uh, where if you've got a bit of a chest infection, and sometimes if you have a little bit of diarrhea, that inflammatory process sometimes can make your CA15-3 go up. So the take-home message is if you have a tumor that produces a, a tumor protein that can be measured, by all means know about it, but please, please, please don't let your sense of happiness or despair be affected by what the level is. Um, and probably the most important thing is that the trend of the uh, tumor protein is what helps an oncologist make a decision. On its own, it should never dictate a change in your treatment. And sadly, I've seen a few ladies where that's been done. They've been on a treatment, eight weeks later, the tumor woke up, so they had their treatment change. Eight weeks later, the tumor went up, they had their treatment change. And that's really, really a bad thing to do. Questions? Because it's a trend. It helps with the trend. It's just the trend. So, uh, I mean, unless a patient of mine has a tumor marker that's, you know, 54, 56, 72, 69, 3,420, I'll take note of that tumor marker. I will never change treatment because of that, but I will chase it. If I can't feel it, if I can't find where I think it's coming from by talking to the patient, I will scan. So that kind of, you know, and it's rare that that ever happens, but a very pronounced elevation in the tumor marker can be valuable information. But it's the trend that I use. Okay, so what I want to do, and I hope this is going to be the most useful for, for all of you, is I want to, in a, in, a, in a general way, say, what are we doing and what should we be doing to really improve survival? Not just progression-free survival. How can we help metastatic breast cancer patients live longer, have a higher chance of going into remission, and possibly those, those, those few that can actually be cured from metastatic breast cancer. 
And this is the treatment approach. It is absolutely vital that time is spent in talking to you uh, and um, examining you if you've got symptoms to try and assess where and what your breast cancer is doing. Yes, you absolutely need to do blood tests because that will tell you whether the cancer is actually starting to interfere with your organ function and that's a really important part of assessing what's happening uh, with the, the pace of your cancer. You absolutely have to have uh, x-rays and scans and I know that many, and I, I must admit, I don't know what's happening, maybe, maybe you're just getting tired of me sighing, but many of you are now accepting the need to have scans without uh, being worried about uh, the radiation exposures, but you've got to look at the balance of benefit versus harm. Yes, in the natural population, you don't want to be getting uh, extra radiation than you need, because obviously with the atomic bomb, radiation causes cancer. But can I just say to you that never in my professional lifetime has the number of scans I've done on a patient harmed a patient. I have never had one case of radiation-induced cancer. However, if you don't do the scans at the appropriate time, you may not know what's going on with your cancer. And the worst thing is to, to be behind the eight ball, left the cancer growing for an extra three months because you didn't want to do the scan then, and then find out that it was now double the size. Uh, PET scans uh, in 2019, no, 2020 has now become uh, on Medicare. So again, it's not the end or be all scan. It is to be selected for a particular purpose in different patients, uh, but it is an extra way of imaging uh, that might be useful for some patients. And probably the most important thing, and you know, we've published on this and there's increasing evidence on this, and it is now in the international guidelines. It is always important to consider biopsying one of the secondary tumors if the response to the treatment is not behaving the way you expect it to, in a, a women already diagnosed with breast cancer that is stage four, uh, and in many, many, many women who have had breast cancer years ago and the cancer uh, is suspected to have come back, a metastasis uh, biopsy is really, really important. So this is a message that I hope is going acro across the land and uh, many people are doing this now. So this is just sort of a table of all the things that I look at when I make a clinical evaluation of the treatment uh, that you should be getting. Um, and as you can see, it's not just one thing. So sometimes I have a patient say to me, uh, you know, my estrogen receptor status is only 5%. Shouldn't I be having chemotherapy? You know, the hormones aren't gonna work. And that might be correct, but it may also be incorrect based on all these other factors. So the tumor burden. How long ago did you have breast cancer before it came back? Is where your cancer secondaries are life-threatening? And that is the most important point. Because if as an oncologist, uh, it is determined that where your secondary breast cancer could potentially kill you in the next three months, you almost always have to have chemotherapy, irrespective of what kind of breast cancer you have. Other things are, you know, what are your preferences? Um, women will say to me, Arlene, my experience with chemotherapy was so bad because of mouth ulcers and hair loss, I really don't want to go through that again. But you've got to remember, uh, hair loss and mouth ulcers aren't uniform side effects of every single chemotherapy. Many of you have had the um, advantage of using the cold cap machine, so hair loss isn't always necessarily a, a side effect to be dreaded. Um, it depends on how physiologically fit you are. It depends on what your menopausal status is. It depends on whether you've got rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, heart disease, and other things going on. It depends on what your mood is and how you're coping with your illness and other issues with psychological factors in the past. It may be completely inappropriate to start someone on aggressive toxic treatment um, if she's just gonna not, be, you know, she's gonna give up after one week of treatment. So all these factors, plus the cost, plus the travel time, plus the impact on your family life, your children, your work, all these things go into the mix in my brain and um, uh, essentially in, in oncologists' brains when they're looking at how best to treat this patient. Uh, but ultimately, be assured that the goal of the treatment always is longer survival, best quality of life, least side effects. So that heads everything, but you take all these other factors into consideration. So as I said, some of the things that we look at is tumor biology and tumor burden, and just very, very quickly, yes, it is possible for patients who had HER2 negative breast cancers to then have breast cancers that become HER2 positive. But there are also publications showing that patients who had HER2 positive breast cancers can lose their HER2 receptor. 
Uh, we were one of the publications that showed that in a study of over 110 patients, there was no patient that actually gained a HER2 receptor. But having said that, this is the importance of doing biopsies. The same can happen for ER uh, and PHAR status. You can have these rates of positive to negative, but you can also have negative to positive of those rates. So if somebody recommends for you to have a biopsy for these purposes, you can understand what's being done. The next thing we look at um, is looking at what are the uh, consequences of any previous treatments that you've had. Do you have terrible tingling in your fingers? Have you had um, cardiac dysfunction from treatments or from other health issues? Are you allergic to certain drugs? How bad were you affected with nausea and vomiting? And so it's really important to know how your experience in the past has been with a particular family of drugs when discussing and recommending the next line of treatment. Choice of treatment variably comes down to clinical trials. Nobody who has metastatic breast cancer should be treated outside of results of a clinical trial. And that's just a statement of fact. Um, and just to show you what has happened, this is to hopefully give you um, excitement and hope. Look at all those different drugs that are available. And this is how we look at it. We look at trials that have included hundreds and thousands of patients. We essentially look at whether the tumors are endocrine responsive or not. The next thing we ask is, are they HER2 positive or not? And then we go through all those things that I've talked to you about on previous slides in choosing the best drug. And very importantly, if you do have uh, secondaries uh, of a significant load in your bones, particularly if they're lytic, so that is the, the cancer has gone into the bones and it's actually making a hole in it, you need to have bone-targeted drugs discussed and you need to have all your symptoms managed alongside the treatment. And this very quick slide just shows you, and this is a bit outdated, it's about a year old. All the drugs on the right have been evaluated for breast cancer. Much, much more than any other cancer types. A little bit disappointingly, the ones in yellow are the ones that are available in PBS. Now, having said that, I'll just go backwards. Although many of these drugs have been evaluated, not all of them have yet been shown to improve either progression-free survival or overall survival. So don't just feel that, oh, there were all those other effective drugs and they're not available. These are other factors. What's your ethnic group? And that impacts on the, the rates of polymorphisms and how your body pharmacologically handles drugs. Do you have other health issues? What's your preference? And all the things that I've talked to you about. So these things all come out in the decision making of what you should be getting. And that's my take home message. You want the best results, you gotta take all these factors into consideration for every individual patient. And I stress the individual bit because obviously there are many, many, many women in the community with uh, breast cancer, some with early, some with advanced. And obviously you will have friends and family members um, with breast cancer. And it's a real danger in comparing what worked for them, what didn't work for them, and trying to uh, imp uh, you know, use that information to feel confident or not confident about the treatments that are recommended for you. Don't do that. You're being treated as an individual. You take that into account first and foremost. So just <coughs> close to finishing, um, metastatic breast cancer is treated very differently to early breast cancer. Uh, I think that there are very clear guidelines, there's availability of drugs, and there is absolutely no excuse for not using high-level evidence to make treatment choices. We are very, very conscious here at BCRCWA of the importance of family members, husbands, carers, supporters, because you are an integral part of how to manage and give the best results for your loved one who has breast cancer. We continue to strive in doing clinical trials. Uh, we are very excited because we have a multidisciplinary team of specialists, nurses, allied health, clinical psychologists. And what I'd just like to show you is that these are the 12 international published guidelines by the Advanced Breast Cancer Consensus Consortium. And um, those things that I've highlighted, I've already talked about in my preceding uh, uh, slides. And I think it all goes towards how this is a recognized approach. So no single woman anywhere in the world should not be treated in accordance with these guidelines. 
so I've just uh, finally just give you a bit of an update. We have 30 active trials ongoing and hopefully you'll be encouraged that 22 of them are focused on metastatic breast cancer. Um, the trial that I talked to you about before is a study called LAMS that was the acronym was devised by a very clever young lady and um, it's called the Longitudinal Analysis of Metastatic Breast Cancer Survival. And what we're going to do, and it has been done by others around the world, but probably not in the same fashion, is that we're going to review um, data in over 950 women, because I've seen, as I said, over um, 1,000 patients with metastatic breast cancer, who actually have accurate information in terms of their follow-up, the treatment they received, and their outcome. Outcome in terms of death, outcome in terms of progression-free survival. And we're going to try and publish on this to be to, for, for two purposes. One, to give you guys hope that there really can be the possibility of good outcomes. And number two, to really try to advise um, the community as to how the best approaches should be taken in an outside clinical trial environment to get the best results and the best survival rates. Uh, we've just started this uh, study. We've got ethics approved. So hopefully we'll have it published maybe by this time next year. But just to give you a little snippet of information already, we've already reviewed some of the published work and the most, one of the most recent published data came from Philadelphia from 2019. They looked at uh, 1,400 patients with metastatic breast cancer. They had an 8% incidence of women living over five years. Now compared to published data, that might sound a little bit low to you, but it's probably not that bad. We've just had a quick look at our data, and to date, of our over 950 patients, we have an incidence of 24% of patients survive over five years. So that is a proof of concept that following guidelines using evidence-based treatment can really give you the best results. We do have three immunotherapy trials going. We've got an oral chemotherapy trial going. We have a national study looking at iribulin. This is a chemotherapy that some of you have received to really try and advise oncologists how best to use this drug. We have um, drugs looking at uh, endocrine positive uh, patients with the new drug. We have uh, a trial that we're probably going to be initiating together with a friend of mine from uh, the UK looking at non-chemotherapy agents. And we have a whole lot of molecular biology studies that we're initiating uh, from BCRCWA and hopefully it'll be published within the next year to two. And so this is just future things. You know, how can we use um, what we know about biology to benefit patients? We really, really, really need to spend more time and more efforts and get better results for women who have spread of the cancer to the brain. How do we make new, these new agents affordable? Um, and how best to use the information that we uh, gain from the laboratory to translate into the best uh, consistent high quality of care for all patients. That's my last slide, and I'm now going to open it up for you to ask me questions. Okay, so Fulvestrant is a drug called an SERD, which is actually called a selective estrogen receptor degrader. So the way Fulvestrant works, different to tamoxifen and uh, aromatase inhibitors, is that when it finds an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cell, it sits in the estrogen receptor and it destroys the estrogen receptor. And that's how it's thought to be effective. However, for those of you who've had it, you know it has to be given as dual injections into your buttocks every month. Uh, so as effective as it is, it, you know, it is a little bit uncomfortable and it has to be done generally in a sort of a, a specialist center because it's a big volume of, of uh, fluid to inject. The big problem with fulvestrant is that it's not on a PBS. So the only way to access the drug is if you are prepared to pay for at least three months worth of the drug uh, and then there's an access program that you can get onto. So there are some women who I would recommend a fulvestrant uh, as treatment for, but they can't afford the $3,000. So we're very excited because we've been, we're involved in a trial that is evaluating an oral CERD. It's thought to be as effective as fulvestrant. Um, and the advantage of this trial is that if you enter the trial, it's a randomized trial, um, and half the women will get the new oral CERD. If you don't get the new oral CERD, and I uh, think it's in your best interest to get fulvestrant, the pharmaceutical company will pay for the fulvestrant. So going into the trial is a bit of a win-win situation. Uh, I don't know whether the trial is being done elsewhere in Perth. Jeanette, do you know? Is Act 1 being done elsewhere? 
Yeah, we might be the only centre that has this trial open, uh, but it's recruiting well, and if we can finish the trial internationally, globally, quickly, and it's got positive results, then hopefully it will roll out relatively quickly. Okay, so the question is, uh, having had several lines of treatment, uh, do you ever go backwards to something that you've had earlier on in the piece? So the, the short answer is yes. There is no evidence to suggest that using a drug that you've had previous exposure to, but at a higher dose, makes any difference. So it's not the dosage of the drug that's important. It's more about whether there has been enough time elapsed between that first or second drug and what you're having now. Um, two, are the side effects of that early drug that you want to use safe to use? And three, is it going to be able to be used for a prolonged period of time? So yes, there is definitely evidence that says if you had tamoxifen four or five years ago, you've gone through aromatase inhibitors, even a, a CDK inhibitor, chemotherapy, your cancer is still estrogen positive, I absolutely do see patients responding going back to tamoxifen. So the, so the question was, uh, what's my thoughts on non-cancer uh, drugs being used but to use to treat cancer patients? Um, because there's been a little bit in the news about beta blockers, um, metformin, which is a diabetes drug. So the short answer is that uh, in the laboratory, some of these um, heart drugs and diabetes drugs has been shown to have an effect on the cell growth of some cancers. Uh, but unfortunately, you've got to remember, any information you ever read in the newspapers that talks about the effectiveness of a drug in a rat, in a petri dish, until that drug has been formulated into um, a dosage and a schedule and treated in cancer patients, so not just all cancer patients, but breast cancer patients, and shown to be effective, you can't use that information uh, on its own. Um, I do know that there are some women around town that have been recommended for metformin by their oncologist. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's actually not the right thing to do. Although it's generally a well-tolerated drug at, at low doses, uh, I, I don't know, one, whether it in itself may have then an impact on the effectiveness of the proven conventional cancer treatment that you're on. Two, it could actually cause uh, un, sort of low-level side effects, which then makes the quality of life of that patient worse. Um, and three, you know, if you're trying to use a non-cancer drug because there is some effect on the biology of the cancer, you really want to be very confident that you're not changing the biology of the cancer for, to make it worse. We've actually quite excited. We've got a trial that's going to look at um, immunotherapy in non-triple negative breast cancer. Uh, but for women who have cancer still present in their breasts, so these are going to be early breast cancer patients, because we've got the ideal situation where we can give a course of immunotherapy for these women and then have biopsies to show whether it's actually having an effect on the cancer. Lupron's I mean, already been used as a, uh, uh, a treatment for advanced you know, cancer. It's, I wouldn't put it high on my list to be used. Uh, so, so the question was, is there any link between breast cancer and skin cancer? And I, I assume you mean um, one causing the other or, yeah, no. The short answer is no. Uh, so neither uh, BCCs, squamous cells, and melanoma, there is no data to suggest that these are linked. They're not thought to be her found in hereditary familial cases. Uh, the question was, what should be the current recommendation for um, uh, uh, a woman in her 20s or 30s who is known to be a BRCA mutation carrier but does not have cancer. So they're very, very clear international and national guidelines. Um, and essentially, in terms of reducing the risk of getting breast cancer, the options are to consider bilateral mastectomy with reconstruction uh, because there have been some studies that clearly show that with mastectomy, even though you can't remove 100% of breast tissue, you can certainly remove more than 95% of breast tissue, it's associated with about a 92% reduction in the risk of that woman getting breast cancer. Secondly, and this is a, a much more difficult discussion because in a young woman who is still fertile, who's not yet menopausal, but removing ovaries can reduce the risk of getting breast cancer in a BRCA mutation carrier. But I generally don't discuss that with a young patient because the health concerns, you know, the inability to, to have your own children and so forth, they're, they're, they're factors that need to be considered as well. In some parts of the world, women with BRCA mutation carriers are offered tamoxifen 
as a chemo prevention, not very highly used in Australia for a whole not, lot of different reasons. And then the last thing is absolutely, if intervention isn't going to be accepted or, or chosen, then surveillance should be done. And currently the surveillance, and this is on the Medicare, is to do an MRI of uh, both breasts, uh, which is covered by Medicare, uh, in conjunction with mammography and ultrasound, in conjunction with um, a good clinical examination of the breast every six months. And there is actually good data to support women who are BRCA mutation carriers doing breast exams as opposed to everybody else who has had breast cancer but doesn't have the BRCA mutation, um, or even if you have never had breast cancer and you don't have the BRCA mutation, self-breast examination is not recommended because it doesn't pick up cancers and cancer recurrences very well. So the question was, are there any age limits on the clinical trials? Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to say no. For the vast majority of the trials, back. 10 years ago, the, the, there wasn't usually an upper age limit of 75, but that's been removed. I think the ageist um, uh, a, approach has really changed all that. And it's really about uh, what the physiological health of the patient is. So we're really pleased. We don't have any upper age limits for the vast majority of our studies. Yeah, the problem with that is that already, because these are patients that uh, I've treated over the last sort of 20 years or so, the uh, robustness of the data trying to go back and find what lifestyle changes were made, it's not possible. Uh, you know, many of these women have passed away already, uh, and uh, it's not something that's possible to glean from, you know, medical notes and so forth. I think... I, I've, you know, from my point of view, when I ever talk about lifestyle changes, I think that we've talked about some of the things that uh, I've mentioned before. And I think there's good enough data to support exercise, low alcohol intake, non-smoking, weight, you know, control. I don't think there's any discussion in that. I don't think there's any um, suggestion that if you, you know, didn't, if you did that, that isn't going to help. Whether, and in, a, in a retrospective study like this, I'll never be able to just select out the lifestyle variables that my patients have undertaken and said the reason why they've lived such and such is because of that. I won't be able to, to attribute that. So we're trying to do it in terms of, to a lesser degree, uh, looking at weight as a sort of a, a marker of good health. Uh, we're also looking at, um, uh, at least at diagnosis, alcohol and smoking habits. Uh, but because I don't routinely record that information, you know, during the life uh, time of the patient, uh, we can't actually see whether stopping or changing makes a big difference. Okay, so the question is, uh, have I seen women going into remission with metastatic breast cancer? And the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, I mean, this all come out in the paper, so I won't go into too much detail, but I have um, several patients, and they're not huge numbers, so please don't go away and think, uh, Arlene says women with metastatic breast cancer can be cured and discharged, but I have a number of women cured, off treatment, and I know they're alive because they drop me a line every year. And this is now added 18 years. I have several women who are cured, but on treatment, usually just a hormone pill, okay? I have several women who are in complete remission, and complete remission is a very, very um, uh, detailed definition. To have a complete remission title, you have to have a normal CA-15-3, you have to have every organ that was originally involved with cancer look completely normal on your scans. And I have several women who are in complete remission. The majority of those women are still on ongoing treatment. Um, a few we've talked about stopping and observing. Um, so yes, it's an absolute possibility. And I actually have a lot of women who are in partial remission. So there has been absolutely no change in their scans or their blood tests for months and years on the same treatment. So what we're gonna do with our study is to look at, you know, what are the numbers, what are the incidences, and what are the factors we think makes that possible? Okay, so the question was, what is my opinion about um, the evidence coming out about uh, medicinal cannabis? Okay, the data for metastatic breast cancer is actually embedded in the data for metastatic cancer. So that's the first thing. No, there's been no study specifically just done in metastatic breast cancer. The strongest 
uh, utility of medicinal cannabis is in the terminal phases of disease, where patients who are experiencing severe pain, severe anorexia and poor appetite, and severe nausea, that the use of medicinal cannabis can be uh, substituted for or um, given to therefore reduce other opioid and other drugs to improve the quality of that patient's experience. That is the, the, the only evidence. There is no patient evidence that it kills cancer. There is no evidence that um, if used in conjunction with something else, it's going to be biologically useful. Um, there is no evidence that use of medicinal cannabis for women in the non-terminal phases of their disease is better uh, than something else that we're using now. It's the old adage. It's, the th it's, it's almost the fact that medicinal cannabis is natural. It's prohibitive in the past. It's kind of got this, you can't get it, so it must be good for you because the authorities are conspiring to, s to stop you from having something that's good. And it's got this mysticism that it's something that's worthwhile. The, oh, actually, the only other thing that is worthwhile talking about is that um, medicinal cannabis is also metabolized and can have an impact on a series of proteins in your liver called the P450 cytochrome uh, enzymes. These are the same enzymes in your liver that are responsible for metabolizing a number of different drugs. CDK inhibitors also have an impact on P450 cytochrome. So I've now been getting a couple of letters from the clinic that is doling out um, medicinal cannabis saying, uh, we just want to ch make sure that you're happy that our patient's gonna, your patient's going to go on this uh, because of the effect on the P450 cytochrome. And I've actually stopped them having uh, it being given because there's a danger that the medicinal cannabis might actually make the CDK inhibitors more toxic. So if there's only one message new that you take away from this is Arlene does not think medicinal cannabis is the new cure drug for breast cancer. It should only be considered in the terminal phases of someone with metastatic disease. And its role anywhere else in between is very, very unsubstantiated. So the question was, what's the um, uh, evidence for pesticides and chemicals used for food production uh, impact on breast cancer? This is one of the cancers where that kind of chemical um, exposure has not been thought to be a risk factor. So I mean, clearly, uh, you know, I think there's a pretty much an overwhelming health um, a potential to trying to you know, do without a lot of these extra chemicals. Obviously, it's good for your health, uh, but it's not particularly a worry for breast cancer. Yeah, okay. So the question was um, evidence suggesting that having uh, milk and meat protein um, increases your risk of getting cancer, whereas if you have a vegan diet, it lowers your risk of getting breast cancer. There is data to suggest that um, some of those factors uh, in terms of a, a high protein intake can be impacted on a number of different cancers, not just breast cancer. Okay, but you've got to look at how those studies are, are, are designed and looked at because it often is um, contaminated by the fact that people who eat a lot of meat protein often tend to have higher levels of alcohol, often tend to be of a higher body weight, and often have lower rates of exercise. I mean, that's not the, the, the absolute, but that is a, an association. Um, and so I don't have a problem if, if any of my patients want to stop having meat protein and having vegetable protein. You know, that's your, your food choice. I think that's fine. But there's certainly no high-level evidence to say that that kind of dietary al uh, alteration will have a direct impact on your cancer shrinking and dying. Uh, on the other side, you know, do, does a strictly vegan diet, is it more conducive to cancer cells dying? There's, again, no high-level human data to, to suggest that. But having said that, people who are very committed and can stick with a vegan diet tend to be slimmer. They're almost always non-smokers, non-drinkers. Um, and so that association will have a, an impact on you know, breast cancer outcome, breast cancer treatment, and so forth. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I can certainly say is that, um, uh, and these are obviously just anecdotal cases, but I've certainly had uh, very sad memories of at least two of my patients that really were very strong believers in this diet directly having an impact on cancer. I had one patient uh, dropped her weight down to about 32 kilos, one patient dropped her weight down to about 35 kilos, and they both died of cachexia and starvation. It was, it was terrible. It was terrible, terrible to see. Cancers made no difference, because they actually came back for me to, to monitor them. Cancer was growing, um, but they just 
chose that path, and I it just I just find that heartbreaking. Okay, so the question is that um, there's some uh, evidence that some uh, breast cancer treatment drugs can get into the brain, but specifically the question is, can chemotherapy get through the, the barrier to the brain and cause um, uh, cognitive uh, impact? And the short answer is no. Uh, it's one of the uh, downsides, actually, of using chemotherapy to treat a patient uh, with breast cancer because very little of it gets into the brain. Um, the chemo fog that women experience when they have um, chemotherapy for early breast cancer uh, is almost certainly a multifactorial um, event. It's not just the drug because, as you know, we often use steroids to help with nausea and vomiting. Um, and there's actually a lot of um, data suggesting that just the diagnosis of breast cancer can affect the vascular supply to different parts of your brain. There was a fascinating study uh, reported about five, six years ago where um, uh, six women in the U.S., were recruited to a study where at the point that they were diagnosed, they were uh, underwent a study and they had an MRI done. Some of these women went on to have surgery and then nothing else. Some of these women had surgery and radiation. Some of these women had surgery and then went on to have chemotherapy and tamoxifen and all those other things. And they repeated the MRI in these women. And it was astounding. I think it was something like four of those women, uh, or two thirds of the women, before they had any treatment, already had evidence of some perfusion defects in their brain. And whether they got drugs or not, radiation or not, a proportion of those women had perfusion changes even after just surgery and general anesthetic. So we think that you know the general anesthetic, the surgery, the emotional upheaval of a breast cancer diagnosis, maybe even the uh, scans and, uh, uh, you know, and contrast, um, and, and, and certainly in some of the drug therapy, all of these things, and I think probably one of the most important things is if you render a premenopausal patient postmenopausal with chemotherapy or removal of the ovaries, you dramatically lower her estrogen levels very, very quickly. And that will almost have a very you know, immediate impact on cognition and thinking. So I think chemotherapy per se, it is not been shown to be harmful to the brain, uh, but it is probably one of the players that can be impacted for you know, memory loss. That's a really good question. So the question was, uh, you know, I've demonstrated to you the, the scientific rationale behind why guidelines and, uh, you know, pathways of treatment is so important in getting the best survival for your patients. Uh, so how do we ensure that uh, oncologists and other centers are doing that? And this really comes down to um, uh, professional education. Uh, so uh, from a proactive side, uh, there is a need for every doctor to accrue continuing medical education credits. So this occurs across the board. Surgeons, oncologists, we all have to demonstrate to oncologists that you're keeping up to date. Now, um, the way that oncologists keep up to date is variable, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but there is some, you know, at a higher national level, uh, method of ensuring that oncologists attend meetings, uh, present cases, uh, publish papers, uh, run audits within their own um, departments, teach junior doctors. These are all ways of ensuring that you know what you're doing. Um, so you can be assured that every specialist is under that kind of collegial sort of um, monitoring, if you like. But again, you know, there's going to be a big variation. And I would probably say, you know, my take-home message, is, which is what I say to juniors, is that no matter how much you love taking care of patients and being a clinician, if you want to be a really good doctor in any field, you need to keep up to date with your research. Because what you know in 1999 is going to be different to what you know in 2004. Because things are changing all the time. And there is absolutely no possibility you go to one meeting that runs over four days that you're going to learn enough to actually teach you. So you've got to keep that reading up constantly. So as a profession in medical oncology, and specifically breast oncology, we have a lot of interdisciplinary meetings. Um, so within my own group in BCRCWA, we meet once a week with radiation oncologists, pathologists, surgeons, oncologists, nurses, and so forth. And that, although is a meeting to help make decisions about patients, it's actually an educational period as well. Because we, we hear what the surgeon says about the approach to certain things. The surgeons hear about my new drugs. The radiation colleges tell us new things. So it's a constant learning. Beyond that, there are uh, regular meetings, um, which unfortunately 
it's good because, you know, I can update people, but it's bad because I have to update people, if you know what I mean. And it's a lot of work, but it's, it's kind of rewarding to know that you're keeping other people up to date with my area of expertise, which is breast cancer. And then at the international level, um, you can teach, you can attend meetings, um, but obviously a lot of this is self, you know, perpetuated. Um, and I think overall, you know, the purpose of these kind of meetings and I think the fabulous job that uh, the breast cancer consumer groups do with good evidence-based information is that, you know, as a, a group of patients, you ask a lot of questions and that's good. Um, you know, I, I always try to encourage, you know, infor uh, information to be understood and you understand the rationale and it should be good you, that you read and go to your treating doctor and sort of say, look, I've read about this, what do you think about this? And I think that's a good way to kind of give yourself the confidence that, you know, the treatment is being given in terms of the guidelines. So by telling you guys these are the kind of things you should look out for, this helps you to ensure that that's what's being done as well. So I think, you know, community education for breast cancer is such an important part. And I see this as the way that I can reach and help women in all of WA, in all of Australia, by the fact that we give these kind of teachings. You know, you don't have to come and see me, but just read what I suggest is the kind of things that you should be looking at in terms of how you should be treated, and hopefully that will mean that they'll get the best possible treatment. Carmelo, when does the new building open? <laughs> no, we can be a little bit more. We're thinking we will be in there by July. So this is an open invitation for all of you uh, to attend the opening. I hope you will celebrate with uh, me and others uh, uh, for a project that's been in the, in the, as an embryonic stage in my mind for about uh, 10 years, uh, and we're really excited. It's going to be called the Perth Breast Cancer Institute, uh, run by BCRCWA. We are going to have the most comprehensive, multidisciplinary group of specialists and allied health uh, in uh, uh, WA that's going to help existing patients and new patients have a, a, a much more tailored, personalized, rewarding, rationally decided uh, path in the treatment as they're diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, and all of this, I, I have absolutely no doubts, will lead to better outcomes. So the question was how uh, do we interact or base our research with uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies and drugs? So there's a very, very clean line. I do two levels of research. One level is I collaborate um, and I pick and choose which ones I do because I get asked to do a number of pharmaceutical trials with a company that's got a new drug which I believe in and I know information about and I think it's gonna be beneficial for my patients. So that's how I decide which drugs I'm going to evaluate and offer to my patients. The clinical trials are run at an incredibly high level. Uh, a testament is that I have 13 members of staff, fabulous women uh, who work in the breast clinical trials unit that help me do these trials to make sure it's done at the highest level. We are monitored, we are audited. Um, it's, everything is looked at to make sure that these drugs are as good as what they say they do. So because the companies invent these drugs, I never invent the drug. I look at the drug, I look at the data for the drug, I make comments about how you know, we should monitor and treat better, and then I test it out to see whether it's better. If it's better, I have the joy and the pleasure of uh, teaching about it and knowing that these drugs go into the PBS and I had a, play, uh, a part to play in doing that so that all women in Australia can get access to the drugs. So that's where my research is. And in terms of the pharmaceutical trials, I can impact by looking at other aspects of those drug trials, like quality of life and other things, which we get publications and teaching out of that. The second type of research I do are non-drug related. It's all about how do you make drugs more effective by understanding the biology? How can you lessen side effects by understanding what causes the side effects and what can be done to minimize the side effects? And then a big part of what we want to do is not directly drug related, but how do you help women live better quality lives when they've got metastatic breast cancer? How do we support their husbands? How do we make the kids, how can we make sure that the kids aren't suffering um, and adding to you know, the concern for their own health and their parents' health? How can we make sure that um, you know, they're not, patients are not um, economically compromised uh, by the treatment they're having? So that's where my other research arm is, and most of this um, you know, is done through either grants 
or funding through the donations that are generously given to BCICWA. I would probably say we are a testing unit for new drugs, but we're a development unit for all the other things that matter to women with breast cancer to make it better. You know, nobody looks at children. We were the first people to publish a paper on what the effects of a breast cancer diagnosis has on children. Uh, nobody really looks to make sure that generally, you know, answering that first question, how do we make sure there's consistency of treatment across all units? So we do a lot of things. We look at, we, we interact, we uh, collaborate with other uh, hospitals. We present, uh, publish data on our own data as an example of, you know, if you do this, this is how it works. So by that, that, that sort of thinking outside the box of drugs, uh, we hope that the information and the data that we provide is helpful for other people in the community treating breast cancer patients. We're very excited. So most of you know that my preferred provider is uh, Perth Radiological Clinic because they are really a good, high-quality team of radiologists. They're going to be uh, in the ground floor of the new building, so you won't have to, have to go to you know um, the Mount or Subiaco, other places. I mean, obviously, if your scans are you know distant to your visit with me and it's closer to Jindalup or elsewhere, you're still welcome to go to those places. But um, all the interventional stuff, all the biopsies that I do, will be done in our building on the ground floor. And next to them will be the radiation oncology provider. So it's all going to be on the same floor. So when you're, for a woman diagnosed with breast cancer who may need further imaging, who may need radiation, who may need a plastic surgeon, who may need genetics, it's all going to be incorporated within our building. I think there's a couple of things. So the question was, how important is it to get a second opinion from another oncologist? I think what I would probably say is it's your comfort level. You know, if you've been referred to someone that you had no choice or no say in, in going to, then obviously you're going to have your own questioning of what you would expect in terms of the interaction with that oncologist as to whether you feel very satisfied uh, or not. Now, obviously, if you're not satisfied, it doesn't matter what you're going to do. But you're going to want to get another opinion to get more satisfaction. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that, and I don't encourage this, but, you know, um, Google, not Dr. Google, but Googling of the people that are involved in your care is not a bad thing to do. You, because that will give you a, a public um, reflection of how uh, involved in research a specialist is. It doesn't have to even be an oncologist. Any doctor you go and see, you know, how much do they teach? Um, are they affiliated with a university? Um, do they um, do research which is published? And you should look at all that. You may not have to understand what they do, but just someone that's involved in teaching and research already gives you the confidence that this is a person uh, that is involved in being up to date. I mean, the third thing is obviously, although I advise you not to doctor Google, many of you do, so you will then come in with a bit of a preconceived opinion of what you think might be good or not good. Now, I, th I would always encourage you to bring it up for discussion, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, my approach is, is I will give you an honest appraisal of what my opinion is of your opinion of the treatment, but you're coming to me for my expertise, so I will give you the best treatment recommendation for that person, and it's individualized based on all those things that I've said to you before. So if at the end of that discussion, um, you've got a checkbox and you sort of say, uh, still not happy, then by all means get a second opinion. The problem with getting a second opinion, uh, for the sake of getting a second opinion, is you may actually go from someone who's actually giving you the correct treatment to someone who may actually give you the incorrect treatment. So the, we've, we actually have a, a discussion about this uh, when we were at meetings to say, a second opinion oncologist has the advantage that you are the new guru, because you've already been told everything by the first one, so everything you say is either going to be a little bit novel, a little bit more sophisticated, and so forth. The other thing is the second oncologist also has the foreknowledge of what's already been done and tested and have a bit more information. So the second oncologist may actually have a little bit more um, nouns to make their recommendations sound impressive. On the other hand, the second oncologist may not give you the right recommendation, and so you've got to go through your own head in terms of now who do I listen to because the first one said this, the second one said that. You know, and uh, personally, I think you introduce more concerns into your mind now because now you've got to make the decision for yourself or for your loved one, I'm going to make the call as to who I think is the best because you've been given sort of two different recommendations. But to get a second opinion when you're very happy with the first, I actually don't understand why you want to do that. Because, you know, I haven't talked about this, but 
I think part of the reason why I love taking care of patients with breast cancer is, you know, when you take care of someone with breast cancer early or advanced, you're getting to know that person for often years. And in that, you have to have a sense of trust. I've got to trust you guys that you're kind of listening to what I'm asking you to do uh, and that you're telling me everything I need to know. And you've got to trust that I've got your best interest at heart. If you don't have trust with whichever specialist you see, that's usually a reason why you would get a second opinion. Does that answer your question? I'll try and be very succinct. I, I wanted to be a, a doctor from the age of about eight. I'm very single-minded, and you know, all of you who know me know that that's the case. I haven't changed since I was eight. Um, and I think probably just cut a long story short, my desire to do medicine has always been about helping people. Uh, I've had the absolute blessing and privilege of, you know, being in a, a family and a country and a city where I was able to go to medical school. Um, some of you know I had a really bad car accident when I, when I was in fourth year medical school and almost wasn't able to go back to doing anything. So the fact that I was able to finish my medical degree and go on to be a specialist to me is just a wonderful blessing from God. Uh, many of you know that I'm a committed Christian and therefore, you know, I see my job as a medical oncologist as my life's journey you know I'm a mother and a wife and a friend but in my what I do as a person is I try to help people and I really really enjoy that I can't help everybody um, some people don't um, uh, see what I'm doing as helping and you know I have to accept that um, so I'm really driven by people I love people uh, and if I can help particularly women at the point where they've been told they've got breast cancer which is devastating and even more devastating when the cancer is back and it's potentially incurable. If I can just play a small role in making their life's journey, no matter how short or long that is, better, I feel that I've done what I'm here on earth to do. And a, a big part of breast cancer for me was that it gives me the ability to treat various parts of your body, even though you all uniformly have breast cancer, but it can involve every other part of your body. So as a physician, I, I need to know my skills and cardiology, neurology, all those things, and that's intellectually stimulating. And being a researcher means I can be at the top level of my game and offer patients potentially the best possible treatment three, four, five, six years before the time. And, you know, it's so rewarding when I give, uh, you know, one of my patients a hug at five years or ten years and know that with confidence that they're almost certainly cured. Some of them will come back with metastatic disease, but the vast majority are cured. And that's a really nice thing to do for somebody else. So that's why I do what I do. <clears throat>